Um, there's just a few little announcements we need to make. Firstly, who did we get that from? That was from... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Anna, um, Anna is Anna S. Is you stand up, Anna? That's Anna S. These are Anna S.'s contact details. Anna has a, a copy of all of our YouTube presentations and all most of the documents that are on our website on a hard disk of her own. Um, the hard disk is 500 gigabytes in size and if you want to have a copy of all of that information it's just a matter of buying a disk and going to Anna and asking for her pretty please to copy it for you and she'll, she's willing to do that for you. So that'll give you a copy of all of the presentations we've done since 2008 uh, with the exception of 10 talks that we haven't mastered yet. Um, Eva, where is Eva? You want to stand up, Eva? So this is Eva. All right. Eva is now living up at Vilhelmina. You're pretty much living at Vilhelmina. Um, and Eva is very interested in setting up, with her husband, setting up a learning centre. Um, and they want to do that at Vilhelmina. So it's a, a fair way. And if you want to ask questions about why it's a fair way from here, we can answer those questions. But... Uh, you also have DVDs, copies of different DVDs that have been done, and you also have a hard disk copy that I haven't given you yet. <laughs> um, now, somebody asked me earlier to get a copy of, of hard their, uh, for their hard disks. If I give either the copy, then I can't give you a copy because that's my last copy. Um, so is it all right if I give you the copy and they can contact you if they wish to have a copy as well? So you can either, to copy your hard disk, you can either get ask Anna to do that for you or Eva to do that for you. Done? It just there are some copies of DVDs here. For people who are new especially, there's introductory packs. So there's some introductory packs, is there? I saw them. Uh, Danielle, are they still they're here? They're gone. They're gone. They are gone. They're, they're all gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. They were. They were some, but they're gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and you about the hard, hard disk? Yes. Um, I'm going to make one copy for Ulla, yep. and we have talked about this, that connect to somebody close to yourself, Ulla is in Gothenburg and so is uh, Anna, yep. and it will be easy to make more copies. Yes. And if you want to, just contact me and I'll help you out. Yep. Too. So uh, I think here, um, how many, if you can buy, if you're going to buy a hard disk to make copies, you're better to buy a USB 3 hard disk than a USB 2 hard disk. The reason why is a USB 3 hard disk is about four times faster to copy. Uh, a few people gave me a 2 hard disk and that took me about 20 something hours to copy. Whereas a 3, if you use a USB 3, it takes only about five hours to copy. It's a lot of information, <laughs> uh, as you can imagine. There's 600 hours of video uh, and a lot of audio as well, 600 or 800 or so hours of audio, and so it's all on one disc, so lots of information. Um, our website, Mary and I's website, is called www.divinetruth.com, and um, we don't get to update it very much when we're travelling, but when we're home, generally any new talk that comes out, we place on the website as an audio file. And then when the video is mastered, we place the master of the video on YouTube. And there's a link on our site, usually to the YouTube master, once we get our site updated. But I'm the person who updates our site, so it doesn't happen all that regularly at this point in time. Does that make sense? So they are contact details. These are in Sweden, obviously, and then this is our site in Australia. And the YouTube site is uh, obviously available to you to to, um, to download information at any time that you that you want. We also have uh, um, an office address, um, which I should say, it's called office at divinetruth.com. 
And we have some people on that on uh, responding to emails that you might send to them. And what we're trying to do with most people's questions, though, is we're trying to incorporate the questions into an interview process. So rather than responding to individual people's questions, what we try to do is get all of your questions together and then we put them in subject, ma in subject matter. And then what we do is create an interview where myself or Mary is being interviewed by somebody else on that subject and then we post that in interview on YouTube. Now the reason why we're doing that is because we receive so many questions that it's impossible for us to answer them by typing and uh, it's far better if we can answer them verbally and, uh, and so what we do is we get all the questions together and we're in the process at the moment of putting together all the questions you can think of on different subjects and then placing the, the answers to those questions as one file or a few different files on YouTube so that you can watch a whole interview and get answers to question after question after question on a particular subject. You notice here in our conversation here, we've had many questions on different subjects, and sometimes when you're listening to a presentation like that, um, it gets a bit disjointed and hard to follow. And so what we're trying to do is put all of these questions that people ask into one kind of process so that you can actually listen from the beginning to the end and have a fairly comprehensive set of questions on a, on a particular subject answered. So that's what we're attempting to do uh, at the moment. To and Now, all of these things happen for free. If you want to contribute, there is a donation box up the back of the hall, and we'd love to thank you for those of you that have donated already. That would be... Uh, it's really lovely that you've donated already. We, myself and Mary live off of donations and everything that we do is done via donations as well so we don't actually ask for any uh, specific you know fee to enter a seminar or any of those kind of things it's all just done by donation and uh, and if we don't get enough donations then we just don't do it <laughs> that's how it works and then if uh, a lot of times we get um, now we get more donations and that in lets us buy things for the website and to, to do it additional things like camera work and, uh, and other things like that. So that's what we do with our funds. Yeah. You just mentioned Lena and Eagle's work. Um, oh yes, the, the man who does a lot of our video work for us, um, he, we have a link to his, if you wish to donate to him, because he does it all for free as well. If you wish to donate to him, he's, he, he's on our website. The names of the two people are Lena and Igor. They are Ukrainian. A couple who we met in Australia, and um, Lena and Igor, um, Igor in particular, both of them have a lot to do with mastering the information. And Igor does all the computer work for us to get all the masters together. He uploads them to YouTube, and he does the whole lot of that for free. So, um, so if you feel like you would like to donate to him uh, directly, then please, please do so as well. He would definitely appreciate it. He, he's working almost all the time doing different things, updating the information and, and try, trying to also get a lot of the older information that we've presented also on YouTube as well. So at this stage, he just before we came away, he did five or six solid weeks of work so that I could get your the disc uh, with almost all of the presentations on that disc before we went away. So he does a lot of that work. And myself, I, I do the sound work generally, uh, the sound editing and the website editing and quite a few other things as well. Um, and we also back up all of that data as well so because we want to keep a record of all of the data. So all of those things happen uh, with volunteer effort from different people. Yep. Are there any questions about the those kind of things, and I can rub that off. Everyone's got the details written down that they need from there. Yeah? You can see... It's a question about... Um, about this? Yes. You're quick off the mark. <laughs> <laughs> Fire away, <Nicholas. laughs> Uh, is it possible to get uh, contaminated by, by some other person's feelings? 
by some other person. Other person's feelings. If they're really feeling oh. really bad and possessed, then uh, is it can it affect me in a bad way? Uh, in New Age, you talk about protection when you're uh, like a therapist and work with real sick people and usually have uh, stones and uh, yeah. crystals. And in a New Age philosophy, there is a lot of emphasis on protecting yourself and protecting yourself from negative energy, from negative vibrations, from negative spirits, from uh, negative entities, sometimes they call. And this focus on protection is all about fear. It's all about the fears we have. The, the reality is that um, I cannot infect you with an emotion unless the emotional openness to such infection already exists within you. So if I start talking about something that makes you afraid, I'm not afraid about talking about it, but it might make you afraid, you could then claim that oh, I'm infecting you emotionally with my fear. But, but it's not my fear, I'm not afraid. We're, there's a fear within our, in yourself. So what, what happens is that if you think of your soul, or, and I'll draw you as a person, here's yourself, Inside of every single person, there are addictions, which I would classify as a desire for somebody else to help you with an emotion or a feeling or a sensation. There's also um, pure, some pure love at times. Sometimes it doesn't feel like there's much with it, so other times it feels like there's a lot. There's also fear within us. There's also anger. There's also, at the same time, um, kindness. Compassion. Right? In other words, a group of emotions. There's also desires. I view desires as pure feelings, not addictions. So a lot of times, many of us view uh, our addictions as our desires. But uh, I see desire as a, having harmony with love and truth. If it's harmonious with love and truth, I see it as a pure desire. If it's not harmonious with love and truth, I see it as an addiction. <coughs> Does that make sense? But you can see all these things exist within us. There's many more things, of course, too. We have personality. We also have a set of experiences. Does that make sense? There's just so many things exist within us concurrently. They're all at the same time. Now, here's another person. This is me walking around, <laughs> carrying my baggage, which is all this baggage. Some of the baggage is nice and light, and when other people experience it, they go, oh, it's wonderful. And other baggage is dark and negative. And when other people experience that, you know, there's this feeling of, oh, it's dark and negative. But how can these feelings infect another person unless there is an openness to receiving the feeling. There has to be an openness. Now in New Age circles, what people do is they try to protect their self, themselves, almost like putting a force field barrier around yourself, so that you're sort of living in a cocoon and you don't have to experience these emotions. Right? And some also enlist the help of spirits, people in the spirit world, to place barriers around them as well. Some even think that they can pray to God to pay for this barrier around them. And I'm telling you that such thing is an impossibility, because God created this system. <laughs> Do you think he's going to protect you from it if he created it? <laughs> it's not logical to believe that. But many do believe it because they have spirits masquerading as God, interacting with them. There are many spirits in the spirit world who believe themselves to be God, in fact. 
and they masquerade as God. So when you ask for God to protect you, and all of a sudden this wonderful protection comes out, oh, God's protecting me is the feeling when it's just a spirit doing what you want in the moment. And why would they do that? Probably because they want something in the same moment. That's usually the case. So we have spirit protection, we have our own barriers and so forth to openness. My suggestion is, if you really want to do things God's way, we need to break down every barrier we have to feeling. In other words, we need to stop putting barriers around us. We need to allow the emotion that's coming from our environment to enter us. And if it enters us and we have not got any resonant emotion, in other words, another emotion that it reacts to, it'll just pass straight through us. We don't need any protection. We are completely protected in that place. Now, for the majority of us, we have a lot of these emotions, of course. So one of our emotions might be fear. So when this person comes along with their fear and starts talking about their fear, what happens? This fear comes out of them and, and it resonates with our own fear. It, you could use the term vibrate if you want. It's an emotion that we're feeling that we have fear, they have fear. Now the two of those things are in harmony with each other. And so now that fear will probably pass through me. And because I've yet to release fear within myself, it won't It'll stop within me. It'll settle inside of me as a result. Now, there might be another person who has no fear at all. But he will talk about a subject that makes you afraid. So, for instance, if I talk about a subject of earth changes, things that might happen in your location... This year, that will cause a major upheaval in your life. A lot of people then go, he's making me afraid. I'm not making you afraid. I'm not afraid of that subject. And so therefore, I'm not making you afraid. And a lot of times I speak of spirits. Like last week on Sunday, I was told that uh, when I speak of spirits, I'm very, very negative. Well, I don't feel negative. <laughs> I feel the truth is very, very important. Right? So I don't feel negative about talking about spirits. But if you do, then there's something going on inside of you, you see? There's got to be something resonant or something inside of you that causes you to be afraid of that discussion. Fear is the biggest thing that it creates a openness in us to receiving the projections of another. So your question, getting back to your question, was can somebody else infect you with their emotion and cause your state to worsen? Yes, they can. But only if I have an openness to receiving it from them. Now, in New Age circles, what you would do is you'd surround yourself with a protective barrier to not receive it. Or what you would often do is leave the person who's like that. Whereas I sort of see it very differently. I sort of see that person has been a law of attraction event brought to me by my own soul to confront an issue in my soul that's out of harmony with love, truth or humility. Does that make sense? Can it be the same uh, condition with a, uh, if it's a medical condition? If someone is sick and I get contaminated. Does that have to do with emotions also? Well, much sickness, as, you've, as I've already been pointing out, is caused by spirit influence. So if I have an openness to certain things, and there's spirits that are around these people who are also willing to project their feelings at me, then certainly I can even get sick from that infection, if you like, of a spirit. But again, I would need to look at what is the cause. And the cause is the feeling within me that needs to come out. Does that make sense? If I protect myself from the situation, I won't find the feeling. I need to allow the situation to occur and see what the feeling is. When I see what the feeling is, I can feel the feeling. When I feel the feeling, I can release 
the emotion that causes the attraction in the first place, and now I am automatically protected because I am no longer open to that projection. Yeah? And this is where I feel most New Age philosophy and also many other spiritual movements on the planet neglect the personal responsibility of our own condition. They blame the external rather than looking first at something within me that attracted the external. Do you understand? This is very, very important to understand. If we are humble, we won't do that. We will look at ourselves first, not the external. We will see ourselves first. Yeah. Can you just turn the mic around to Anna and then come down? Yeah. I'm a body worker. Yes. Uh, and I was wondering, how can I do body work in harmony with love and truth? Well, or can I? <laughs> you have already answered your own question. If you do it harmonious with love and truth, <laughs> if you have a feeling of love for the person, yes. and you are truthful with that person every single moment they're laying on the table with you, and you are completely humble to your own experience and also to theirs, then you have the ability to help them in harmony with divine truth. Mm, scary. When you're trying to get them out of their emotion, mm -hmm. now you're out of harmony. Yes. When you're trying to get them away from truth, now you're out of harmony. When you try to imp impress upon them that you are more developed than they are, mm. now you're out of harmony. Mm. Do you see? Like yes. The, yes. Every single time we get out of these things, mm. we are now out of harmony with love and truth and humility. Now we can't help them. Mm. True help can only be given when we're in this space. And when we're in this space, our spirit guides can actually assist us to help the person and we're not stopping it. We're not impeding the process. When we're out of this place, now we're interfering, we're impeding with the process of what our spirit friends can even do. And we're also not helping the person anymore because we're helping them stay blocked yeah. rather than helping them become open. So this, this process of being open is very important. See, if I'm humble, I will admit to myself that I am open to somebody being angry with me. When I say open, when they're angry to me, I feel bad. That tells me that I am open to somebody being angry towards me. If I close that up inside of myself, I will not any longer be fearful of an angry person. Now when I say close it up, when, when I still feel the emotion, but I actually patch up the reason why I feel bad when somebody's angry. The main reason why we feel bad when somebody's angry is because we, we feel bad about ourselves before their anger began. And all they're doing most of the time is reminding us of how bad we feel about ourselves. If you didn't feel bad about yourself before somebody was angry with you, you would never feel bad about yourself after they were angry with you. Does that make sense? And this is something we need to bear in mind. Now, when you're on the table helping a person, if the person has sadness or has other emotions, if I am blocked to receiving or feeling those emotions, then it's like an imposition upon them. So let's say the lady who's laying on my table has... has <coughs> excuse me... <coughs> has some uh, sexual, ra sexual rage in her. Rage because she's been harmed or people with her have been harmed, people with her meaning spirits, have been harmed sexually in the past and she feels really angry with men as a result. And let's say inside of myself I'm not comfortable with that. Right? I am automatically from my soul now got a block upon her to feel that feeling. I am impressing upon her that she shouldn't go there she can feel anything else, but she's not allowed to feel angry with men. Now, if I'm impressing that upon her, I am no longer helping her, am I? I'm now harming her. And this is where our body work can finish up harming people. Because we can actually be with them, thinking we're helping them, and end up actually harming them by trying to suppress them and what they're going through. 
And we need to be very careful of that. Mm. We need to stop suppressing people. Yeah. 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 The, the way I would impress upon that person is simply through my own lack of humility to that emotion. Yes. Or what that emotion would trigger within me. Yes. So if, I, if I don't want to feel my own problems with somebody's anger with men, whether that be personal or whether I also have anger with men that I don't want to feel, then that is automatically going to suppress the other person from feeling the same emotion. And it doesn't matter if I say, oh no, you're allowed to feel it. Mm. Makes My no difference what comes saying. out of your mouth yeah. because what's yeah. coming out of your heart is Total. don't feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? You see, see, when we're humble, we see what's coming out of our heart rather than thinking that what's coming out of our head is what they're feeling. They can't feel what's coming out of our head generally unless they have feelings. There's also feelings coming out of our heart that are aligned with what's coming out of our head. And I see this happening all the time where people think they, they are open to something, but at the same time the emotion coming out of it is, don't you go there, don't you go there, don't you go there. And so what I'm feeling from the person is, don't I go? I can't go there. And if I honour their free will, I can't go there. And when they come up to me and say, I would like to know the answer to this question, I have to say, I'm sorry, but you don't want to know the answer to this question. Because here is saying to me, don't you go there. While you've got the mind going, I want to know, I want to know. And a lot of times we want to know things not because of wanting to deal with them. We want to know them because we're afraid of dealing with them. Do you understand? A lot of times we want to know things in our mind because we're afraid of feeling them in our soul. And so we ask question after question after question after question after question, not understanding that all of our questions are telling us that we're very afraid to feel exactly the subject that we're questioning. Now I had to... Uh, it was self up the back first and then... Ma'am? Uh, Okay. Yeah, I know that uh, a lot of people they they, um, they, they are trying to, to um, do something about what's happening inside of themselves. Yes. Uh, and uh, they they don't have ways of doing this uh, in, in an efficient way, and maybe avoiding things you are talking about now, <coughs> and maybe playing the game with somebody else or something. Yes. Uh, I wonder. Could, could you uh, help us with, with uh, the the ways that, that you can uh, address and handle those things when you when you know it's inside of me? I want to handle it. I want to do so. Can, can you uh, t help us a little with methods and, and ways we, we can uh, deal with this? And um, certainly, I've answered this question many times on different presentations, and I'm not sure whether. Um, I can answer it conclusively in a short time now because we've only got a couple of hours left. Um, but I've answered these questions about, I've called them emotional processing or working through your emotions. There are quite a number of presentations on uh, YouTube that are, that are about working through your emotions and actually allowing and releasing your emotions. But can I just state a few basic truths about it? Yes, and then we can. Then you can look at that material separately. Yes, made of your basic truths. We'll come back to this uh, influence side of things. Let's start with complete denial of an emotion, because that's where the majority of us are when we start. We're completely denying that we even have the emotion. Does that make sense? Um, a lot of times we get into this space because denial, we feel, is a way of managing the situation best. And many of us have been taught from very, very young age to manage the situation through denial rather than feel. And so we've grown up, and, and in your society here in Sweden, you've, many of you have grown up with very heavy denial around you. Right? where your mum and your dad don't want you to feel anything except particular emotions. And if you're sad or you're ashamed or you're afraid, they cuddle you out of that emotion or they suppress the emotion in other, using other ways. 
And so we end up being in a state initially generally of denial. Now I would call that denial intellectual and emotional. <coughs> it has both components in that we have, it hasn't even occurred to us at this point that we're angry. Does that make sense? Like, or it hasn't even occurred to us that we're upset with our mothers. Or it hasn't even occurred to us that the reason why I've attracted three relationships that have failed has to do with some childhood emotion that I've yet to release. So no, no intellectual awareness or emotional awareness that that is true. Right? Now, once, when we're in that state, we must first be honest about one thing. And this is something that we need to all bear in mind. We have a thing that our soul creates. So here's our soul. So mine is the male soul connected to my bodies, right? Remember, the soul is the real me. And in my soul is a heap of different emotions and a heap of beliefs and so forth. Now these emotions and beliefs all relate to either a lack of love, truth and humility or, or actually love, truth and humility, but they are emotions and beliefs and there's many other things inside of me of course too, desires and so forth that I listed before. Now, my soul is this powerful creator. My soul sends what it is out to the entire universe. But it's not what I would like to believe it is that gets sent out. It's what it actually is. So if I would like to believe that I'm not sad at all, but I'm really sad, then what gets sent out of the universe is I'm really sad. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And if I'm really ashamed, and I don't want to believe that I'm ashamed, what really comes out of me is I'm really ashamed. That's what goes out of me. Now, if you think of any belief you can have, you can literally have thousands of beliefs that are connected, connected to emotions. Easily have thousands of beliefs connected to emotions. Every single one of those emotions and beliefs is sending out a message to the universe. Now, God, in her infinite wisdom, created a law. It's called the law of attraction. You've heard of that law? Okay. The law of attraction states that whatever is the truth of my soul, my soul will attract in order to correct itself. In other words, God created this law so that we could be sensitive to correction. Right? Now, if my soul has an emotion, a belief, a desire or any other thing inside of it that is out of harmony with these basic principles of the universe, which are love, truth and humility, then my soul will send out its condition and the law will pull in an attraction, an event or a series of events. Events that tell me the truth. You could think of the law of attraction as a law that tells you the truth about yourself. It's beautiful because it, it never lies. It never falsifies. And you don't have to have anybody tell you. Your, the events of your life are already telling you what you're attracting. Does everyone get that? Yeah? Very powerful law. Now, if I am in denial which is that first state of, of dealing with emotions, if you like. But the events of my life are showing me that I'm actually, I've had, let's say I've had one or a couple of broken marriages and my children, my oldest child doesn't like me very much and, and my, you know, I had, uh, had my workmates at, at, at situation and some of those workmates treat me condescendingly and so forth and so forth. All of these things are telling us about our true condition. All of these events. And the first way to get through that is to accept this underlying truth intellectually that the events that are happening to my life 
are telling me the truth of what's in my soul, even if I'm in denial of it. Does that make sense, Deborah? Yeah. The law of attraction is a very beautiful law, and myself and Mary notice our law of attraction all the time. You can actually go through minute by minute your life and see what you're attracting once you understand the law. Right? And, and it's absolutely amazing to see what you're attracting. Because you know what we do, many of us, is we, we remember all the things that are good that we attract. And we try to forget all the things that are bad that we attract. This is one thing that we do naturally. Now, what happens there is every time you neglect something that the law attracts, the law of attraction places, there is another layer of denial placed on your soul, which increases the intensity of what you're going to attract next. So in other words, if you don't take notice of the little messages, the bigger messages come automatically because of the creation of your soul. Your soul is putting, every time you deny a message, you're denying humility. You are actually becoming harder and more proud. When you become harder and more proud, your soul puts out even a stronger message that's negative that then creates even a bigger event. That's how it works. Right? And this is, this is something God has done to, to break down our resistance to love, truth and humility. Do you understand? So we have the free will to make any choice we wish, but, but if we choose to, to resist the basic core principles of the universe, which are love, truth and humility, then what happens is the events will ramp up, demonstrating to us that we're out of harmony with the law and out of love, basically, out of harmony with love. Now, if we relate this to this, the question was, how do we go about processing emotions or getting to them even? Well, the first la layer is denial. And what gets us through our denial is the law of attraction demonstrating events in our life. And if you notice the events, you will start to become more aware of what is within you. I feel the next step in this process is awareness. Now, there's two types of awareness. There's intellectual awareness and emotional awareness. Awareness is when I now am no longer in denial and I, am now, I now can see the events that my soul is attracting and I realise there must be a cause within myself that attracted these events. That's a state of awareness. It's a very good state to be in. A lot of people don't like that state. That's why they live in denial. Because when you're aware, you go, wow... My soul is so powerful, it creates negative events every single day. <laughs> and you, you understand? Like you start realising that, wow, that also must mean that I am fairly out of harmony with love every single day. And that I'm pretty out of harmony with truth every single day. And I'm not very humble every single day. It, this awareness grows within you. It's like looking at your face in the mirror and going, wow, I've got a few lines here and blemishes there. We see ourselves as we truly are. It's very, very good. Now, once we get some awareness, now we have a desire, generally, that needs to develop. So my, my feeling next for me is that next needs to be created is a desire to address the issues. See, you can be aware of something... But it doesn't mean that you want to fix it, right? So, for example, you can be aware that you really want a man to love you. You can be aware of that. That's called an addiction. You can be totally aware of that, and instead of fixing that within yourself, you just look for a man who will love you. Does that make sense? Yeah? <laughs> Can you silence it? Is that right? 
And you look for a man who loves you rather than actually dealing with the fact that you don't feel loved by a man. Can you see the difference? Now, my desire might be, I want the man to love me. Now, that's not what I would call a desire harmonious with love or truth. The desire that's harmonious with love or truth would be, I want to remove from myself my addiction to being loved by a man. Can you see the difference? Mm -hmm. I want to actually get rid of the causal emotion. So true desire is about looking for causes, the true causes, rather than dealing, rather than, doing what a lot of other people do, and that is looking at effects. And this brings in another law. What, one other law that God's made is called the law of cause and effect. Unless you address a cause, dealing with the effect is pointless, is the way God feels. What we are doing on a planet is we are often ad addressing effects because we do not want and do not have a desire to want to deal with the cause. So, for example, when you have a headache, there must be a cause for this headache. Right? And the cause must exist within the soul. Under the principles that I'm telling you, it's got to exist within the soul. But what do we do? We feel the pain of the headache. And what do we do? Take an aspirin or take some kind of headache tablet. And that makes the effect go away. <laughs> now, God looks at this and goes, hmm, I put the law of cause and effect there so that you would see there's a bigger problem than your headache. And you've just taken it away. Not very wise. Now, most, many causes of headaches are related to sadness, right? To how much sadness we are suppressing within ourselves. I'm not saying it's the only cause of a headache. It's a cause of many types of headaches. So, if I truly had a desire, I would actually allow myself to experience this headache and go, wow, this is all because I do not want to cry. Particularly if the headache was behind my eyes, you know, right behind your eyes. That is a big indicator that your headache is to do with the suppression of sadness. Yes? So I'm going to myself, okay, what do I feel with this headache? If I truly have a desire to find out what's underneath it, instead of suppressing it with a tablet, I will sit down and feel the headache and allow myself to feel what's behind it. What is my real feelings? And you know, it's very rare for a person to not cry when they do that. That's the irony. We have to be fairly suppressed with crying before we wouldn't cry with the headache because headaches can get very painful. Imagine you've heard, heard of migraines. I don't. Yeah. Um, terrible headaches like that. It's amazing what people will put up with just to suppress their sadness, just to keep their sadness away. Now, if I have a desire to deal with the cause, then. I will get to the next step. You understand? But if I have a desire to deal with the effect rather than the cause, then I will not get to the next step. It's just that simple. Yep. Now, desire can be grown. It can be nurtured. It can be encouraged. And desire can also be suppressed. So, for example, if I start crying in front of you, Many of you, is your current emotional condition, would try to make me stop crying. Now, some of you, you go, oh, no, no, it's okay, it's okay, you don't have to cry, it's not that bad. Some of you would go, what are you doing crying, stupid man? <laughs> and others would do different things, right, based on the different emotional injuries that we have at the time towards crying. The problem with that is, is that our environment then is suppressing me, and then I would go, okay, I have an event. My environment's suppressing me from crying. Why am I attracting that? Something must be in my soul. <laughs> attracting my suppression of crying. There must be something that I want. I want somebody to suppress my crying going on. 
Once I have my desire to deal with the cause, people around me will not be able to suppress me because I don't want to suppress myself. Right? So, so far we've gone from through our denial into our awareness and then both intellectual and emotional awareness has to occur at some point. And then we have to have some kind of building desire to actually address the real reason why anything has happened. Now, it can be a sickness, it could be just an event of any kind. We need to address the cause as to why it's happened and have a desire to address the cause. And if you don't have a desire, this is where prayer comes in, I feel. You need to ask for help with your desire. So if you, and this is where we can be honest, we can go, okay, the truth is, I don't want to address my neediness for women. I just want women to do what I want. <laughs> That's the truth. Now, obviously, it's not going to help me, but it's good for me to at least acknowledge the truth. Right? The truth is a part of the universal laws that I need to acknowledge. So I might say to myself, okay, I obviously have this emotion in me where I want women, I'm needy for women's attention and approval. I want, I want them to give me attention. Huh? And I have no intention of dealing with it. I just want somebody to come along who will give me the attention and I'll be fine. Right? And then I, if I'm sincere, I'll go, okay, but, but it's not very loving because I'm demanding something from a woman. And I'm not very humble because I'm not wanting to get to the bottom. So, so what I would do under those circumstances is pray. Pray for more humility and more desire to actually, for the desire to actually address the cause to grow. And obviously with any prayer, you've got to act in harmony with it. So I would investigate why I am not wanting to deal with that emotion. I would actually investigate it. I would, I would ponder about it, think about it. I would talk to other people about it. Why do, am I so resistive? to growing a desire to deal with that emotion. Then what will happen, once I pray about all those kind of things, there'll be something exposed. And what will be exposed is the addiction. Now, addictions are all emotional. They are all somehow tied up with our emotional state. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, once I've grown my desire to know the cause, I will find an addiction. A desire in me to have someone else meet my demands rather than me have to get deeper into my emotions. Now, when my addictions are met, a good sign about addictions is when they are met, when they are validated, we are happy. You understand? Mm -hmm. But the problem with addictions is when they are not met, we are we are angry, sad, and so forth. So, if somebody else does not give me what I want, and I go into one of these emotions as a result, that tells me I have a big addiction. It's, it's great to know what addictions you have. It's great to know. Because if you know what addictions you have, you can do a lot about them. Yeah? Now, if you find yourself reverting to anger a lot, it means that you do not want to do anything about your addiction. And what would you do if you didn't want to do anything about your addiction? Well, you need to have a desire <laughs> to deal with your addiction. So again, I would pray to God to somehow help me develop a desire to actually feel and understand this addiction that I have. Yeah. Now, every addiction is created by a fear. Every addiction is created by a fear. Physical addictions are created by fears, but also emotional addictions are created by fears. Now, 
when I go into addiction, it's because I don't want to feel my fear. I want somebody else to make my fear go away. I want somebody else to make it feel nice and calm and my, me to feel nice and safe and secure again. Does that make sense? So, I need to be prepared to address my fears, to feel them, to actually feel what's going on. Now, if I didn't want to do that, and remember it's a feeling, it can't be a thought. You can't think your way out of your fears, by the way. And many of you might have tried, but they stay with you the rest of your life if you do that. The only way to release any emotion, including fear, is to actually experience the emotion. Now, most of us have the most difficulty with experiencing fear because fear is such a terrible emotion to experience. There are just a few basic emotions that we find the hardest. Fear is one of them. Sexual shame or shame are two others. They are very difficult emotions to experience. Most of us like to prevent them. Right? There are just a few emotions, generally, that we do not like experiencing. And like shame, to me, is also fear. It's a, it's a fear of feeling this terrible emotion that you have. So, so what we do is we have a tendency then to revert back to our addiction. So what we, what we need to do is notice, be aware of, ah, oh, there I am again in my addiction. <laughs> There I am again, doing the same thing as I did last time. There I am again, attracting the same event. My soul is so powerful. It's telling me over and over again. And God's law of attraction is so wonderful that it's telling me over and over again, here it is again, here it is again, here it is again. And as long as I'm willing to feel the fear, every situation will reduce rather than increase. But if I'm not willing to feel my fear, then every situation will increase rather than reduce. Makes sense, yes. And then, over the top of, uh, uh, under, underneath, sorry, our fear is the real healing emotion. And do you know what that is? It's grief. Pretty much all psychological circles now on earth know that the healing emotion, the true healing emotion is grief. You get to the grief and actually experience the real grief, not manufactured grief. Remember this one up here is manufactured grief. Sorry, this one here in addiction is manufactured. So, so when I don't get an addiction met if I cry, that's a manufactured grief. That's not the real grief I'm talking about. I'm talking about the grief that happened when you were little that you weren't allowed to release, that has never been released most of your life as a result, and now it needs to be released because your events are telling you it needs to be released. You can release it. Now, the grief is the healing. That's where all of the healing occurs. It's also where many men, in particular, have a lot of struggle. Right? And many women too, um, depending on the society, have a lot of struggle with feeling grief to the full extent. Our societies generally, most Western societies at this point in time, generally have the viewpoint that a certain amount of grief is okay. And usually by a certain amount they mean five minutes, ten minutes. <laughs> a very short amount of grief. That's okay. But if someone cries for two hours in the room, there's something very wrong. Right? We need to fix them. We need to sort them out. We need to stop them from doing that. That's a bad thing. Now, the kind of grief that most of us need to feel is going to be of long duration. Right? And the reason why is we had many, many upsetting events occur during our childhood that we weren't allowed to feel. So now these upsetting events have grown and grown and grown. They all got added to each other too, of course. And they've grown and grown and grown and grown. And we're ending up with lo like years of grief sometimes within us. Mm -hmm. So you, you think back to your childhood sometimes. For many, many of you, I was just talking to a lady just before, um, and she said her mother never loved her from the moment she was conceived. She, her mum didn't want her. And her mum's actually told her that. Right? 
Now, every single day you live with that mum, you're going to feel that you're not wanted. Every single day. How long do you live with your mum? For most people, you know, minimum of 14 to 18 years, yes? For 14 years of your life, you felt that from her. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that also the Sorry, we've got to get you sound. Is that also the law of attraction to get the mother that you don't love? No, it's not your law of attraction, it's hers. It's hers. It's hers, yes. So she... then I get contaminated by her? Certainly you can. Yeah. Yes. And unfortunately for most of us, we have all been contaminated by our parents, by our parents' emotions. But Certainly. don't we attract those parents before and we come in? They attracted us. They attracted us. Our personality, if our parents were humble, our personality would have been the best personality to help them through all of their emotions. Do you understand? That's why they attracted us. But we often incarnate. Our parents attract it. Perfect law. But what they do is they deny their emotions. They are not humble. They're not living in love and truth. And so what they do from the moment we are conceived is all of their emotions start bombarding us rather than them letting themselves feel through every event. They now start blaming their children for every event. Right? And at the soul level, that's often present. But even verbally, many times they blame them. I've, I've spoken to mothers in particular who have said, she was evil from the day she was born. And I go, my goodness, who's evil from the day she was born? <laughs> because it feels to me that the mother was <laughs> from the day the poor child was born, right? And so, so the reality is that... Um, and, and I know some of your questions here, Nicholas, are born out of fear about being contaminated. But the reality is that all of us have been contaminated by the emotions, the unfelt emotions of our environment. And also, whenever our environment was out of harmony with love, truth or humility, it automatically infected us, like a virus. If we go through this process, we can undo that damage. We can reverse, we can reverse it, back it up. The problem for many of us is that many of us don't know about doing it even or even have little desire to do it while we're on earth. And so oftentimes we pass into the spirit world still not doing it. And then many years in the spirit world we start learning these principles and then we start doing it ourselves. My suggestion is start doing it now while we're on earth. Because if you do it now, the secret of the universe will just unfold to you. Because you'll get to this basic principles and you'll understand that the way you can deal with every emotion is within you. you. You have the power to address every single emotion that you are currently avoiding or, ex or not experiencing. That's the beauty of divine truth, is that it helps expose everything about ourselves. Remember I said there were two facets to truth last Saturday? There was the universal truth much of which I've discussed with you, a lot of, you know, about spirits and all these other things, that's all universal truth. And then I said there was personal truth. Well, this is the personal truth. All this stuff, all the stuff that's within us that we need to allow ourselves to expose and address. These are all things that we can go through. Now, obviously, you can see that I'm going to have to have a fairly strong desire to do this. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. For, for, before it's going to happen. If I get to this point and I go, I don't want it to go any further, then that's where I'll be, probably until I die. Right? But if I get to this point, I think, oh, you beauty, my addictions. I love my addictions. I don't want to give them up. <laughs> uh, I want everybody to give me what I need, you know? <laughs> then I'll stay there for the rest of my life. And I won't progress beyond that point in love. Right? Or if I get to here and I go, I'm terrified, I'm terrified, I'm terrified. No, don't you confront me with any truth. Don't you tell me anything. Don't you, let, I, I, I can't feel my, my fear. You know, it's all too hard. And I go into that state. Now I'll be stuck in my fear for the rest of my life. Until I address that emotionally. Can you see? Because none of those are healing emotions. The healing emotion is the grief. 
When I get to my grief, what happens is quite unique. When I get to my grief, and it's truly my causal grief, it flows out of me and I'm left afterwards with a beautiful, peaceful feeling. A sense of peace and serenity overcomes me. Do you understand? And that's a good indication that you are, dear, if you're after you've had some grief, that's a good indication that that grief was a causal grief or a grief associated with your childhood. And many times you will have no memory or just a little memory of what is the cause of that grief, a little intellectual memory, because many of our childhood experiences occurred between the, uh, from the time of conception to the time when our mind began developing, maybe you know, two or three, when, when I say mind began developing, when we started to cognizantly understand what's going on around us. In between that time, we have a lot of negative experiences generally. Many of you, for example, I'll give you some examples. Many mothers were taught that if your child cries, you've got to get it to a certain time before you feed it. Huh? Many of your mothers were taught this. So what they did was they let you cry until the three hours were up. And then they fed you. Now what do you think that does to a child emotionally? It needs something. It needs something. It doesn't mean that it needs food when it cries. It might need other things, right? But it needs something. And, and yet it, it's restricted from it receiving any of those things until the three hours up. What's happening is a desire to control or force the child into not it having its own will met, but having the will of the mother met. Okay. You understand? <laughs> That's happened to most of you. This is why when you get around your mother, many of you lose all sense of your own will. Uh, because it was taught to you from a very, very young age that you must do that. You must abdicate your own will to suit, your own will to suit your mother's. Yes? Now, that emotion is within you. Now, now, that emotion entered you usually in the first few days of your existence. You're not going to remember it entering you, but you're definitely going to feel it. And whenever you go around your mum, you're going to feel, why is it that every time I go with my mother, I always feel like I have to do what she wants, every single time. <laughs> you'll feel that inside of you, you see? And your law of attraction is bringing you the event to trigger that emotion. Yeah? So, so this happens with many of our emotions. We don't have an intellectual... Uh, understanding of the emotion because it happened before our intellectual development occurred. And, but we still need to feel it. And you see, we need to be prepared to feel grief that we don't understand. This is a main problem for us because we want to understand everything. Yes? And so what we do is we try to understand everything and in the process we're not recognising that there's stuff within us that happened before we understood before we could understand anything. And so therefore we're going to have to go through the emotion even though we don't understand how the emotion came in us, we need to still let it out. And this is something that we need to address. Is that the same with uh, things I don't understand like animal cruelty, for example? Is that the same way I have to go through? Yes. That? With your, you know, you, you feel very, very hurt when an animal gets hurt, yes? Yeah. So, so this is a law of attraction event, bringing you an event of hurt to your soul, because there must be some sadness in your soul related to animals being hurt, and most of the sadness within our soul related to other things being hurt is actually related to us being hurt. Okay. You understand? Mm -hmm, yeah. And so, so what's happening is you're rescuing animals but not wanting to rescue yourself. Okay. You're, you're feeling the hurt of the animals, but not wanting to feel your own hurt. And the law of attraction is bringing you situations after situations, and you've even attracted a job yeah. that brings you these situations yeah. after situations that um, constantly cause a trigger to your sadness. Once you let yourself feel the sadness you feel about how you've been treated personally, 
then the law of attraction will bring you some happy events <laughs> relating to animals and that will indicate to you, ah, okay, I'm changing. When I change, the law of attraction is perfect. It, it, it reflects every change back at me. So when I change, the law of attraction reflects the change back at me. It tells me that I'm actually dealing with something, that I'm actually addressing something. Um, but uh, I don't really need to look at all the cruelties on uh, YouTube to uh, acknowledge this. or no. You don't, because your day-to-day -day life is already bringing it to you, isn't it? Like, yeah. you're working with a, um, what do you call it, a vet, and yeah. veterinary service, and your day-to-day -day life is showing you the cruelty of people towards animals, yes? Yeah. So you don't even need to look on YouTube or treat yourself on it. You just need to feel your day-to-day -day life and... Okay. And it will all happen naturally. And this is, applies to all of us. We won't even need to go out looking for them because the events, our soul's powerful, it brings the events to us. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Well. Uh, yes, in the end, it's this life. It's all about to know our God. Can yes. you speak about our God? Because I feel we don't know anything almost about him or her. Yes, I agree. And the problem with doing it right now is you've now started a subject of which there is the maximum amount of information available. And, uh, and um, I'm actually starting doing a series of talks about God now, and, but which I've called Relationship with God. And uh, if you have, on, have a look on YouTube, I've already begun a series of discussions about God. And, uh, and what I'm going to be doing more of, the, I'm going to be doing more of those in the future, whole discussions of four hours at a time, just about God, God's characteristics, God's attributes, and so forth. The reason why I'm talking about emotions is that to actually understand God, you have to learn to feel. And many of us have learned to not feel. We've detuned from our feelings. So I can speak a lot about God, but if a person in the audience is detuned from their feelings, they will not feel what I'm saying. Does that make sense? So this is why it's very important to open up to your own feelings. And if you, can, if you deny your own feelings, you will not be able to connect to God in a very uh, strong manner. And you will in fact instead connect to spirits and other people, but you'll find God, the God connection very difficult. And yet it's the God connection that can bring us the most love. Right? And so um, I find that it, unless people know about what they're doing, what, how they're blocking God, it's very, very hard then to talk about somebody that they're blocked to feeling. And so there is a strong need in all of us to learn to open our feelings to everything, to ourselves first. You know, we need to feel our own self first. And then we can start feeling everyone around us, but also because we're open we will start feeling God when we long for that connection. So if I can uh, delay the answer to that question, and, and if you can look at the things that are on YouTube already about my discussions about God, and I have had already quite a lot of discussions about God and also quite a lot of uh, discussion recently about God's personality and nature and how the world views God as well. And it's worth looking at those presentations to see where a lot of our beliefs about God came from. Because most of our beliefs came from our parents, actually. It came from our, our, the way our parents treat us, we then impose upon God. Once you release these emotions and these addictions and fears, you are able to accurately sense another being. You are, actually, you are able to accurately feel what the other person feels. For that same reason, you are now able to more accurately feel what God feels for you. Right? The problem for most of us is that we are severely blocked to our own feelings 
and so therefore severely blocked to everyone else's feelings, and then also severely blocked to God's feelings for us. And this causes us to live in sort of like a, a, an alone vacuum, really. Many of us do this our entire lives where we're not really connected to anything or anyone because we are so disconnected from ourselves. And I feel the biggest problem we face on earth is not like war, famine or other huge problems like that. They are all the effects of this one problem. This problem that all of us are so insular now and desensitised to our own state that we can't, we don't even know what love is anymore. We, we, we can't even feel love anymore. We feel alone. If we go through this, you actually find yourself opening up. And when you, so when I say this for the recording, I'm saying this process of going from denial to grief, you open your soul up to experiencing every single being around you, every animal, every bird, every little creature, every person, and God. Right? And in that place, you have the capacity then to love. Because if you can feel everything, you have the capacity now to understand and to love. You understand the hurt that another person feels. So, so at the moment, many of you still probably eat meat, yes? Yeah? When you feel for the animals, you can no longer eat meat. That's the reality. You just can't do it. If you really feel. The fact that we can eat meat is an indication that we're not feeling for the animals yet. There is something inside of us <coughs> that's causing us to be detuned from the animal's welfare. And so therefore, there's something inside of us that we need to feel. Yeah, that will open us up to loving those animals in a better way. So, so with regard to any discussion you know, about God, we don't understand that these are God's primary attributes and qualities. Everything in the universe exists in the same way. And if we can understand that and we can open ourselves to feeling, we will actually get to feel God and therefore understand the rest of God's personality or nature. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us more about yourself and Mary? Um, I don't know if everybody else wants to <laughs> hear more, more about it. I feel most of you are quite fascinated with this discussion, is yes. that correct? Yes. So, um, I don't know if, again, it's the right time to do that. You know? okay. um, just my feeling is that most people here are more interested in this information. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to probably continue on this subject, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Have, I, have I correctly judged your feelings? <laughs> okay. Okay, so in answer to your question... Does that help answer your question as to where to go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, the, the address is on your pages and so on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So on that website there are stuff about emotional processing, emotional clearing. I refer to many of these states during those discussions and also give practical examples of how to actually work their way through an emotion rather than um, trying to intellectualise yourself through the process. Oh, fine, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, I find that in the Western world in particular, but in pretty much all of the Earth at the moment, there is a high desire for most people to try to intellectualise themselves into a process. Mm -hmm. But, but the, there has to be a soul change that happens that causes it to become natural. Can I say what the soul change is? Mm -hmm. I said this in the first century too, so I'll just say it again. To come like a little child. To become like a little child. What does a child do with its emotion? Does it go, wow, I'm feeling fear at the moment. Wow, where's that coming from? Oh, it's coming from you. 
Yes, oh yeah, I see that fear. Yes, I see that fear. I'm just going to feel that fear and let the fear pass through me and then I'll be fine again. Does a child do that? No. Huh? Now, a lot of new age people do that, but a child does not do that. Right? What does a child do? It's just terrified. Immediately terrified without any even attempt to understand why it is. It just goes into the emotion immediately. Right? You walk, you're going in your supermarket, you've got the child sitting, I don't know if you have um, trolleys where you can put the child there, I think you do, from what I can remember, and um, you're pushing down the supermarket aisle, you walk past the lolly aisle, and the child starts screaming in its addiction for something sweet. Now, the child doesn't go, wow, I'm a bit embarrassed screaming at this point in time, um, <laughs> Other people are looking at me, and my mummy is not very happy with me, so I think I will stop screaming and I'll just go, Mummy, Mummy, can I have a lolly? The child doesn't do that, right? Why doesn't the child do these things? Because the child feels before it thinks. Doesn't it? Now, if we are to become like little children, it's a switch that has to happen in our soul. It's something that we have to allow ourselves to go back to because it's part of our nature. We have to learn to feel. I'm not saying we have to act upon the feeling. Do you understand? So if I'm angry, I'm not saying, go and be angry. I am saying, you need to feel that you're angry. Do you understand? We need to become like a little child in the way in which we handle emotions. Another way that a child handles emotions is what? It does not judge the emotion. You don't see a little child going, like, screaming, screaming, and then going, oh, oh, that's a terrible emotion to be coming out of me. I don't feel that I can feel that emotion anymore. You don't see a child doing that, do you? Right? You see their mothers doing that. Yes, or their fathers doing that, yes. But you don't see the child doing that. Why? Because the child does not judge its own emotion without help. The child only judges its own emotion when it has assistance from its environment to judge it. Yeah? So judgment of your own emotion is going to have to be let go of. You need to allow yourself to feel. Now, if I'm humble, I won't be going... Well, I'm angry. Well, you're bad. <laughs> Will I at the same time? Do you understand? I won't be judging my emotions so much that I go, well, I'm angry. Wow, that's really bad. I can't be angry. No, I can't. And there's all this internal dialogue going on there, huh? Controlling my emotion. A person who has made this switch into being like the child doesn't do those things. It doesn't judge its own emotion. It doesn't condemn itself for feeling a certain emotion or anything else like that. It allows its emotion to be completely experienced. Yeah? Now, now, when you can do that naturally, without having to try, that has told you that you've made a big shift in your life. That's a big shift to make in your life. Most of us will find it very difficult to make that shift in our lives. Right? And the reason why is because we have so much life judging us where others have judged our emotion that we've now learned to judge all of our own emotions we've now learned to condemn our own grief we've now learned oh, it's better to be strong than it is to be sad we've now learned that it's better to give the facade of strength than it is to feel your fear particularly in company right? and we've learned that it's better to satisfy our addictions than it is to feel anything under our addictions. That's what we've learned. And because we've learned those things, we find it very, very difficult to become like a little child again and just have no judgment of the emotion. When we have no judgment of the emotion, we can quickly get to the cause of the emotion. <coughs> and when we do that, we will find... The grief will flow out of us and the events will change. The events that our soul is attracting will change. Yep. 
And that's a very, very powerful truth that we need to recognise. Now, if the events are not changing, that tells me that I'm here or above. When I say here or above, I'm above my fears and in my addictions or above that if my events are not changing. The events changing will tell you that you're now into your healing emotions. The healing emotion, in particular grief, the, heal the major healing emotion, once you work your way through grief, the events always change. And that's what we need to come to trust as well. That if the events are not changing, then I'm not yet getting at the cause. Quite simple. So it's like an automatic feedback system telling me. Yes? Just if we can go... In the black I think my question is a little bit away from this, so if there is someone is there who is... Ve uh, so it's, it's, a, it's about grief, but not exactly what you're talking about now. So if someone wants to continue just where you was, I can wait. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question about where I was? Yes, if we go there and there. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about um, sicknesses uh, like... Uh, ADHD, will that fit in here? or Every single event in our lives, I'm including every event, any sickness, any event like an accident, any, any event like jobs, any event like when I go to university, when I don't, when I have children, when I don't, all events in my life are controlled by my soul. Okay. Every event, including all sicknesses including everything that happens to me, every disease, every single event is controlled by this soul and what's in it. And if I understand that basic principle, I can cure a lot of things. Yeah? I used to have, have a very sick life. I was a very sick child, had a very sick life up until I was 33 years of age and I started experiencing my grief. Right? I'm now 49 years of age and I've released a lot of my grief. Yeah. And as a result, a lot of those sicknesses that I had as a child up until, and right up until my 30s, I do not have anymore. So I used to be terrible asthmatic. Yes. Don't have that anymore. Every single day of my life, my nose would run. That happens no more. Every single day of my life, I would have all sorts of problems physically that no longer occur anymore. But also, I used to have other events related to my life in terms of my relationships with people that don't happen anymore. Yeah? And my relationships in terms of with my partner, those different things don't happen anymore, the different things that caused trouble before. And this is what I'm saying, is it affects your entire life. Every single thing in your life is controlled by your soul. So when I have students that I really would like to help, they have these kind of problems, how can I reach them? Because I cannot confront them and say, I can help you because I'm not sure that I can help them. Well, obviously, the way to help another person is firstly to learn how it all works yourself. Yeah. So what we need to all do is learn how the universe works ourselves. Once we learn that and we put that into action, our desire will pull us into situations that will help others automatically. Yeah? So we don't have to worry about that so much. So when I began doing this work myself, I was living by myself. I had no partnership, no life, no... <laughs> I was by myself and I was literally, uh, in a period of my life, I was in a basically cocoon. My family had completely rejected me. My friends had all rejected me. I lived by myself. I did not have a job anymore. And I was living in a house by myself in a location that I knew nobody. Right? And you can still do this in that state. Okay, good. Thanks. Because remember, it's your soul. Yeah. It was my soul that created all that. Yeah. And I needed a very intense event before I started to... Feel my grief, yeah. yeah. And and the more sensitive you can become to your grief, the less it will need to happen to you. 
Yes? If you, if you are desensitised from your grief, then lots of things will need to happen to you before you feel your sadness. Yeah. Yeah? That's a natural state. So my suggestion is allow yourself to become more sensitive. Isn't that the opposite of what everyone says, really? Yeah. Everyone says, look, be hard, be strong, be this, be that. And I'm saying, become more sensitive. Because if you're more sensitive, you'll be more sensitive to the event and therefore you'll get to your grief a lot more quicker because you're more sensitive and things will change a lot more rapidly. Uh, it's, it's good. Yeah. What, what is grief? What is grief? Um, <laughs> there are certainly aspects to it. Yes? Um, so you could firstly say that some grief is sorrow. Do you know what I mean by sorrow? So where you feel just a general feeling of sorrow about, usually it's about an event or something that happened to you. There is also another form of grief called remorse. You've heard of that? Remorse or repentance, where you feel not only sorrow, but you want to correct the wrong of what you did. Do you understand? You want, to f you want to fix it. Like There's a feeling that, oh, it's a terrible thing that I have done and I want to just repair this damage. I want to fix this somehow. That, that's what I'd call remorse. Then there's just like general sadness. Where for some reason I'm walking around in this place where I feel sad, but I'm not. the tears are not flowing. Well, I would put that up here still, not down there. Because the reality is that when I am truly connected with my real grief, your tears will be unavoidable. <laughs> now, have any of you had that in your life, where you've had that experience, where, where just you've been overcome by, and the tears just flowing down your face, sometimes you might not even know what it was about, and it's just flying out of your face, and, and it's just unavoidable, you can't control it. That's the kind of grief that I'm talking about. When you can control it, or you can fake it, then it's not the real grief. I, uh, one of my sons was very good at faking his grief when he was young. All right? And uh, what, he, what he would do is he would actually cry. It was just, he, he worked out, it was a great way to control. And so what he did was he'd actually have tears coming down his face... And then you'd realise, you're not, you're faking it. And then he'd laugh. Right? <laughs> so it's not that kind of grief. It's not the kind of grief either, uh, I'm not talking about the kind of grief where you're sad about an addiction not being met. Do you understand that kind of grief? Where somebody's not giving you something and you go, oh, and crying because they're not giving you the thing. That's not the kind of grief I'm talking about. Causal emotional grief is always related to childhood events generally or to the feeling of remorse. And so therefore it will overcome you without you feeling like you can control it. Now, it'll flow naturally when your fear is addressed. So if it's not flowing naturally, don't try and force it. You just say to yourself, oh, oh there's something else I'm afraid of. Because if I, if I wasn't afraid and I have grief, it would normally be coming out of me. Just automatically, yeah. So, and so those are very much a couple of the emotions that are a part of this grief. So I would, I would sort of feel like my next next question would be, um, uh, fear. What is fear? Speak louder. Fear. What is fear? Yeah. Fear ranges. Um, I mean, in relationship to this serious grief that you're talking. About. Yes, yes, and we, I feel fear in is in relationship to any of the emotions that are under it, right? But let's look at fear. Fear ranges from um, a mild, nervous feeling right the way down to terror. All of those emotions I would bundle into and call them fear. So, you know, if, if you, some of you, last week in particular, this week less, some of you last week were dying to ask a question. Yes? But you didn't want to put your hand up. Right? Now, now that, 
might have been a mild nervousness. You go, if I put my hand up, then what might happen? This might happen, that one. I'll be the focus of attention. I don't want to feel that. So you don't put your hand up. Right? Now, that I would classify as a fairly mild form of fear. But if somebody put, ha, had just shot three people in front of you and then puts the gun to your head, what do you think you'd feel then? Many of you would feel absolutely terrified. Does that make sense? And there's a range of terrors and fears in between there. Now, we also go through different responses to our fear. We usually have... You've, um, you might have heard this, but you have a fight or a flight or a frozen response. No? Usually we fight because we want to stop the other person from making us afraid. We fly away for the same reason. We either try to confront the person to stop them or we get away from the situation. The thir third one is when we can't do one of these two things, we generally go into this state where we've now become numb and frozen to our fear. Now all of those are a part of feeling our fear. So can you see you've got a lot of interesting <laughs> emotions, to put it mildly, to feel when it comes to feeling our fear-based emotions. This is why most people get to that layer there and they go, if I have to feel my fear, I'd rather die first. And you know what finishes up happening? Exactly that. Not that they die straight away, but they die before they feel any of their fear. They live their entire life afraid not changing. And you know what? They pass into the spirit world and I've talked to literally millions of spirits who are still afraid. So they can't be afraid of dying anymore because they've just done that. <laughs> they are more afraid of dealing with their other emotions <coughs> than they are of death. And if we look at our own personal lives, we often feel this way. We are actually more afraid of embracing desire or embracing our fears and still doing things, then we are of even dying. And that's a sad state to be in because we're never really going to enjoy ourselves as our soul in that state. Corolla? Yes. Just wait for that. Uh, I think I know what you're going to say, but I uh, say it anyway. Fire away. <laughs> I hear my, your answer while I think of... Question. Yeah, because you've got some spirits telling you what I'm probably going to say. Anyway. Oh, so, uh, I'm, I'm working extra uh, in a really fear zone, fear, fear. Yeah. I mean, uh, as you a guard. In the environment you're working in. Yes, and I'm uh, working as a guard oh, with guard. a pistol, yes. uh, threat, and uh, uh, violence. Yes. And I'm perfectly calm in that. Yes. I'm not afraid, but I'm afraid now when I'm talking about it. <laughs> because when I'm telling people that I do it, it's a really scary uh, environment. Yes. Uh, what and happens? is that because of, uh, that I don't want to do this? I, do you, you understand feel, my question? You want to feel strong and powerful, because you don't want to feel afraid. And what that's done is it's attracted with to you some spirits who make you feel strong and powerful. And what they do is they manage a lot of the situations for you. So when you're a guard or a, a bouncer type of thing, we call them in Australia, and you, you would, you're able to manage many situations because the spirits with you are actually managing the spirits with the other people mm -hmm. and actually controlling them through yeah. that process. And that makes you feel less afraid. So it's actually meeting the addiction to not feel afraid. Yes, Does that's that make what sense? I thought. As soon as you allow yourself to feel your fear, you go, wow, I'm really afraid in this situation. And, and you'll actually get to a point even where you, you'll be standing there feeling afraid and there'll be a different response in people. They, they won't listen to you anymore. <laughs> so you mean if I, I'm not stopping to do this work, it's going to happen? Yeah, if, okay, you, I stop. if you continue the process <laughs> and you allow yourself to feel, you'll find the whole dynamic will change and that was telling you that what was happening before. And 
what you believe is good at the moment, which is this feeling of power, I'm in control, that actually is damaging your life quite significantly in terms of damaging your desires and your passions and what you really want to be doing. Yes, so, and so that's what work, I felt you should say. Sorry? That's what, what I felt you should say because I, well, you, I can't go... You have go. your guide telling you these things. But I don't do it. I, I stay in this... Yes, you stay in yes. the addiction. Yeah. And many of us do this, you see. We have that. We even have our guides saying, well, do this something different here. We need to do something different here. But in that same moment, we're going, no, 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 no. I want my addiction met. I want my addiction met. Yes. And so we're just hungering for our addiction to be met. And while we're hungering for our addiction to be met, we will never release our fear. And that's the problem that we face. We need to stop hungering for our addictions to be met and then we will actually start to feel our fears. And that's beautiful because when we feel our fears, we have the chance to heal our grief. That's the only chance we have, in fact. Yeah? Is it wrong or is it right if you don't want to watch uh, films with the violence? Um, the feeling I have personally now is that I can watch any film at all that's presented to me, very rarely have an emotional reaction to, those, to, the, to the film of any kind. Right? And I have lots of emotional reactions to my life, but not to a film that's portrayed generally. Before that was not the case. There were some movies that I've watched 20 times, and every single time I watched it I cried. Every single time. And sometimes I cried for three or four days. Like, I mean, like, I well, watched a movie, and for three or four days I cried <laughs> after the movie, right? There was one movie that I had that I watched, that I did watch 20 times for that reason. Because every single time I watched it, I cried. So I watched it again, and I cried again, and I watched it again. And now I can watch it without crying. Right? It still affects me, but it doesn't affect me emotionally like with sadness anymore. So, so a lot of times when we avoid something in our life, we usually avoid it because we're addicted to avoiding the emotion that that particular thing brings up. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not suggesting you have to now go out and watch all the violent movies on the planet. The reality is that your events in your law of attraction would already be bringing you some violence that you need to allow yourself to address. Right? And that might be your son brings home a violent movie and whacks it on the TV in front of you and starts playing it and you go, why are you watching this? <laughs> there it is, your fear of the violence. Does that make sense? Yeah. And these are events that your beautiful soul <laughs> is attracting through this beautiful law that God created and, and just encouraging you to become like a child and feel the emotion. Yeah. Yeah, just wait for the mic to come down next year. Sorry. And is just having to manoeuvre. <laughs> I have a situation in front of me. My youngest daughter will go to Indonesia in two weeks. Yep, and awesome. um, uh, I can al already feel the fear. Mm -hmm. And I know I will have a long time of grief when she is going. Yep. Because I have other children who have done the same. So I know myself. Yeah, interesting. And, uh -huh. <laughs> can you see how there's a pattern? Yeah. And that pattern means that you've yet to feel the emotion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. And um, what I'm, I'm want, want to, to ask about is to feel the grief I believe that I will do, but how silly or uh, integral, intelli intelligent is that not to go in, into more of, for example, your information about the earth crack? Yeah, in a yeah. way. Uh -huh. I don't know a lot of it, just a few words of it. Sure, sure. So, is Let's that firstly look at your fear. Hmm? The fact is that if every time your child goes away, you feel a level of fear, and then underneath that a level of sadness, then it's highly likely that the sadness that you're feeling is not the causal grief. No. Because if it was the cause of grief, you would all have released it. Mm. And so when this child goes away, you'd go, I'm happy for you. Mm. Go ahead. Mm. Right? Mm. So the reality is the sadness you're feeling is the addiction sadness, mm. not the grief. Of having a child. 
right? So it's the addiction sadness, it's not the real grief you need to feel. The real grief you need to feel is something that something that's happened in your childhood, your own childhood, mm-hmm. that's caused you to feel a sense of separation from family. Right? And there, see, now that's the grief. That one is the one you need to let yourself feel, but you're not feeling. Right? And so what you do is you cry about something else. And we, we often do this, it's sort of like substitute crying. When we substitute cry, we are not dealing with our causal sadness or our causal grief, we are dealing with the addiction. We need to prevent, stop that from happening. We need to go even deeper and just allow ourselves to feel this separation. So for your separation feeling. Now, this sadness of separation causes you to be afraid of separation. Now, when you're afraid of separation, you also are going to be afraid for the welfare of every single person you love. Because there is a potential that every single person you love will be separated from you through some event. Now, that event could be, you know, just a a natural disaster. It could be a man-made political problem. It could be all sorts of events. Sickness, it could be death that causes a separation. of. But the fear in you causes you to be afraid of all of those events. Yes? So until you actually feel the true grief associated with the separation in your family right when you were very, very young and fully release that, you will continue to project your fear onto your family and friends and other people you know who you love and you'll want them to do what you want them to do rather than wanting them to do what they want to do to help you avoid this terror that you have. The terror, in reality, is not about the death of a person or the potential death of a person. It's about separation. It's about you feeling separated from family and you want your family close to you so that you can feel safe, not so they can be safe, but so you can feel safe. Now, when I speak of earth changes, you instantly worry because one of them is in one part of the world, another's in another part of the world. What's going to happen? We're all going to be separated. And that brings up this emotion of separation for you, fear of the separation. Yeah? So allow yourself to use these events yeah, to, to get to that real emotion. Yeah. Very good. Yeah? Um, I have a question about trauma. Yeah. Um, so, what is, I'll just say, what is trauma? Because it feels, yes, there's fear, terror, grief in that experience. Mm-hmm. And for me, the, there's a lot of traumatic feelings inside of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't really understand my own question, so I don't know if spirits are helping me with this question for themselves, but I feel I should know the answer when I, I, I'm drawn to ask you about trauma. Um, trauma is usually a combination of the different fears we have and the grief all mixed together. But it comes from, it always comes from an event. Usually, in most people's cases, in their childhood, for yourself, it's in first century events. So, so it comes from an event. Now, these kind of trauma are things like you might be, have been driving in a car when you're three years of age, and all of a sudden there's an accident. Right? And you were in hospital for three months, getting patched up or whatever else. That's a very traumatic experience. Trauma can also be quite simple, like you took your three-month-old child along to get inoculated and a great big needle needle got stuck in their arm which they found traumatic. That can be trauma because it's a mixture of pain, grief and fear. It's a mixture of those three things because we have the pain, the physical pain of the event, we have the grief associated with why is my mother, why is my father taking me to place to get this needle and we have the Fear, because whenever our parents feel fear, which often they do when they get the child getting a needle, we feel the fear as well. We have the, so we have a combination of things going on. So most trauma or traumatic events 
are a combination, it's an event which is a combination of grief, pain, physical usually pain, and also emotional pain and terror mixed together. Yeah. Sorry. This is also the case with things like sexual abuse, domestic violence. Um, Depending on its nature, yes. Yeah, there's the feeling of grief, pain and terror all intertwined. Mixed together, yeah. So when we are to release our trauma, we will experience the event again, yes. essentially. We will essentially experience the event again. Except in a feeling state rather than a suppressed state. And except, and it won't be a physical, um, you know, obviously the event won't have to happen again. We can experience the event again as a memory. Yes. But we will feel it in our body. You will feel it in your body. You will feel, like if, you, if it was sexual abuse, you will feel pain in your, you know, if it's, you've been a woman uh, abused sexually in your vagina, then you'll feel the pain of that in your vagina. You'll feel... You'll feel the terror of the pain. You'll feel the grief associated with, why is this person doing this to me? All at once. And you need to allow the experience. Right? And this is where it gets very hard for most people. But the reality is, the child went through the experience. Now if the child went through the experience, you are totally capable as an adult to relive the experience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Particularly, bearing in mind, it's not happening right now. Mm -hmm. It happened when you were a child. And if you truly honour yourself, going through the experience will result in honouring yourself fully, more fully, going through that experience. Now, what I find with most of these traumatic events is that most people avoid them completely in their life. And in fact, for many people who have had serious traumatic events, they are in almost complete denial of them, <coughs> both intellectually and emotionally. And it's only by a growing awareness that they start feeling the particular events. So this requires going through this process or being willing to go through this process of any trauma that's happened to you, allow yourself to re-experience it. Now, I've had to do that myself with uh, all of my trauma and I've had some fairly traumatic events. I've had to go through my crucifixion in the first century along with many other events that happened in the first century that I found traumatic. And so I've gone through this process to a large degree with all of the trauma and so forth. It's a, if you don't judge it, you will get through it much more rapidly than if you judge it. <laughs> if you judge it, you go, if you start going, well, how does this happen? How is it that I feel that? And you start going into that questioning, you will not get to the event very well. This is, this is a kind of thing that I find, personally, I find this easier than some other emotions. The reason why I find it easier is that you can focus on the event and almost all the emotions come up during the focus of the event. Right. The problem with other emotions we have is that it, they weren't caused by a single event. They were caused by a lifetime of projection. So in the earlier example I gave, like with the mother with saying that saying to basically saying to her daughter and feeling that she didn't want her daughter from the moment she was conceived. Now that's very hard to feel the trauma of that in comparison because there is no single event. Mum might have said it, but there's a whole 14, 15 years of this emotion coming from mum that's very, very difficult to sort of bring to, down to a single event. So in those cases, you will usually have 10, 20, 50, 100 events all demonstrating that mum never loved you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And those kind of... That, the, these all add up to the feeling that you have. Whereas a traumatic event, usually while they're very traumatic, they have all of this association all pulled into one event. And so for that reason, they can be dealt with quite rapidly. And uh, 
And unfortunately, I feel even psychi psychi psychiatric and psychological institutions don't really understand how rapidly they can be addressed. Because there is this general feeling that once a person has some kind of post-traumatic stress, that it's very, very hard for them to completely be removed of their stress. And I feel that is because most people on earth have an addiction to avoiding fear or terror. And, and because of that addiction, we stop ourselves. Every time we get close, we stop. Every time we get close again, stop again. Every time we get close again, stop again. What we need to do is break that barrier and just be like the little child that doesn't have the barrier and just continue. And when we break through that barrier, the event will just come up all at once. Now, sometimes you might need people around you to help you through that event, but it won't be an addictive thing that you're wanting them help. You won't want their help to help you get out of it. You won't want their help to you know, make it feel safe or anything like that. You'll just want their help maybe because of some physical reasons why you might need their help, but you won't, it won't be an addiction that you're trying to make. Yeah, um, I, I haven't done those trainings myself, but uh, the training to trauma therapists, they often talk about the risk of re-traumatization. I feel personally that it's impossible to re-traumatize your soul unless you put your soul in exactly the same place as it was before. Now, this happens through avoidance. So, for example, let's say I've had childhood sexual uh, abuse. If I avoid that and I only partially go into the emotion, there is a chance that I'll attract spirits who want to sexually abuse me during the process that I'm going through. That is because I am unwilling to feel the feelings completely. So spirits can... Can re-traumatise re you, certainly. Yes. Okay. But only if you are unwilling to completely feel. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. When you are willing to completely feel, it's impossible for another person or spirit to interfere with the feelings. And this is something that God has created. Uh, it's impossible for another person to interfere with your feelings when you completely uh, honour your own feelings. The other thing is that's also I feel what we need to understand about God is God, when, the way God's made her universe is that when we fully feel our real feelings, there is an automatic protective barrier placed around us to allow us to go through those feelings without re-traumatisation. Uh, however, most people on earth believe in re-traumatisation. Mm -hmm. So what they try to do, and this is why they never get over the traumatic events, because what they try to do is manage the trauma process. Rather than completely embracing the traumatic experience, they partially embrace the traumatic experience. That certainly leaves you open to spirit influences and other things that can damage you, certainly. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about the birth trauma? Is that a very important uh, thing in all our lives? I think a bigger trauma is conception trauma. Uh -huh. Can I illustrate to you what happens at conception? Um, I know that might sound funny to you, but it's, uh, let's describe it. Here's your mother and your father. They have a heap of emotions and traumatic events and feelings, beliefs, and so forth that are out of harmony with love, truth and humility. Right? They, because most parents haven't released their emotional condition out of harmony with love, truth and humility before they give birth or before they even conceive a child, these, both of these parents have huge amounts of emotion in them already. Now, the little soul who starts in the spirit world, who splits in half and incarnates, when these two conceive the bodies, there's two bodies, remember, there's a spirit body and the material, the, the material body or the physical body, spirit body. 
for this half of the soul to connect to. At the moment that this soul connects to those bodies, it starts absorbing the emotional condition of its environment at the very moment that it connects. So from that moment, it is now absorbing every single unfelt emotion in the parents. Every single one. That's what I call traumatic. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of trauma. This is the reason why, by the time we are born, we are often already in a lot of trauma. So, so now coming out of the birth canal, there's already a lot of trauma in us that the birth itself triggers by the physical process. Do you understand? And so this is why we have some birth trauma as a result, because there's already a soul has got all of these unfelt emotions in it from its environment before it even begins. Now then, if you add to that what happens shortly after birth, usually it gets picked up by the <laughs> legs, yes, belted <laughs> to get it going, <laughs> as the saying goes. Now it's also got physical pain associated with this trauma. The very first experience almost of the child is, is a reflection of the trauma it's already absorbed from its parents. It's a reinforcement of the trauma. It knows now it has something to be afraid of. Right? Do you understand? So, so to me, the most traumatic experience that you can experience at the moment on the planet is your own incarnation. Then after that, it just is potluckers to <laughs> what happens in terms of traumatic, traumatic experiences because it depends heavily on what the parents have addressed or dealt with as to what kind of traumatic experiences your soul will attract after that point. So, so one of the best gifts you, you could ever give to your child is to work through these unfelt emotions before you have a child. Because if you, the more you work through them, and even, by the way, if the child's already in the womb, it's best to work through the emotion because the child then is relieved of the emotion. Yes, There is no danger of doing that to the child. So the key is to allow the process to occur. There is less impact upon the child. When there's less impact upon the child, the child is definitely going to arrive on earth, in the physical, in a state that is better than it would have been if we had not addressed the emotions. But uh, this process of trauma that occurs through incarnation does not even need to occur. The way God designed it was that it originally did not occur because you think about it. If these parents have only emotions and feelings and beliefs that are harmonious with love, truth and humility, and that's the only thing they have within them, what will the child absorb? It can only absorb what is within its environment. It will absorb the emotions of love, truth and humility automatically. It will absorb and, and it will be born completely calm. It will be born with perhaps even a smile on its face. It will, be al it, will, it will become alive like breathing naturally without any assistance. It will actually want to be here. Right? And the reason why is because the parents would be in the state. Now that is, the whole of humanity is potentially able to be in this state. And, uh, and this is what I feel is one of the most sad things. In the first century I said, the sins of the parents are put upon the children generation after generation. Down to the third and fourth generations even, you often see the sins of the great-grandparents brought down. And what I meant by that is the emotional condition of the parents that are out of harmony with love, truth and humility cause an impact upon the... As soon as we're conceived, it's the impact is, is automatically brought upon the next generation. It has an in, instant impact upon the next generation. So if this parent's here 
actually did address their emotions and actually became in harmony with love, truth and humility and in harmony with God completely, this child would not experience any negative event that were created by the parents. It would have a law of attraction that was perfectly attracting only loving and truth-based events. It would, only, it would not attract any sad or other event because the soul of the child is pristine. It can't attract any other event. And therefore, whatever happens to the child through its own life would now completely be its own actions or its own desires that create those actions. It wouldn't be the desires of the parents or the unfelt emotions of the parents. Now you think about if you had a start like that, we'd all be pretty amazing if we had a start like that, right? But unfortunately none of us had a start like that and this is why we have to undo the damage if we want to get to be like that. The truth is you can get to be pristine while you're on earth, but it requires going through this process of reversing the impact of those emotions upon your soul. Uh, why are we here? Why are, why are we going through all this? Uh... Uh, the very basic answer to that question is very simple. Okay. God created you so that you could experience her love. That's it. Okay. And it's sad, if you think about it, that the majority of people never experience her love. And that's uh, what I feel is pro probably one of the saddest things that happens on this planet. That the majority of people don't experience the only reason why God created us. <laughs> well, I mean, if we are... I haven't seen so many uh, of your talks yet. Sure. But, but if we are um, kind of um, going up this ladder, 22 uh, mm -hmm. steps, and we are one with God... Don't we experience the love there? Of course you do, but you can experience the love right from the moment you're born or conceived yeah. even. Yeah, yeah. But you can. why why go down? Well no, we only come down for the first incarnation. Yeah, and one thing that I probably some of you would not have heard is that is that in the first incarnation there is only we only need to have one incarnation. We don't need to reincarnate. And in fact, I don't feel there is anything such thing as reincarnation as people teach it. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to reincarnate because we only need one incarnation. And we need the one incarnation so that we can have a body and a physical body and a spirit body so that we half of the soul can experience life. And that's why God created that process, so that we could experience life. But in particular, God created the process so that we could experience love not just life. And this is where mankind has got itself way out of harmony. Because the majority of us experience life without love. And that is the most traumatic experience. That is the cause of all of our pain. Experiencing life without love. God created the ability for us to arrive in this planet fully loved and to be aware of it right? and to experience that love for the rest of our existence. That's how God created us with that potential. Unfortunately, mankind, in his or her infinite wisdom, decide to become self-reliant. In other words, they do not want God involved in the process. And as a result of that, we, con we condemn ourselves to pain. That's what we choose to do through that process. Now, if we can re-embrace the process of connecting to God, we will need to experience some of that pain. We need to let go of that pain. But once we've finished that pain, we no, no longer need to ever experience it again. Ever. Our entire existence. So I have friends in the spirit world who arrived on earth in the same way we all did. We were conceived, arrived on earth in the spirit world, they had the emotional injuries of their parents imposed upon them. They had lots of painful events occur through their life. They died, often in pain. They arrive in the spirit world in pain. 
they started addressing a lot of their emotional condition and so forth and eventually they arrived in the place that I called in the first century the kingdom of the heavens which is like the celestial kingdom which is what I call the celestial kingdom that is the place where you become at one with God and once you become at one with God there is now no more pain none at all you don't have to come back to earth ever again and in fact I mean, there are so many things that happen in the spirit world that you're so busy you don't even think of coming back to earth <laughs> you don't even consider it because there are so many other beautiful things happening at that point now that now that is what god created us potentially to be the problem with taking the track that most of mankind has taken which is one of self-reliance is that it steps away from the only source of all of that which is god so once we step away from the source of that, we need to create our own life using our own knowledge and using our own experiences and deciding with our own intellect and so forth. And in the process of doing that, we become so far away from God that we start attracting, the soul starts attracting so many negative situations because God's always trying to bring us back to her. Right? And so we're going to have to be corrected in that place. And this is where I feel um, there is a lot of things that we need to learn as humans on earth. And that is, if we continue to do what we've always been doing, we are going to continue to get the same result as the human race. And if each individually, each of us continue... To, what, to stay away from God and be self-reliant, which is, our, which is our biggest emotional injury. If we continue to do that, we're going to continue to get the same results as we've always got, the human race has always got from that, which is pain and suffering. It does not need to be this way. And in fact, God created it to be quite differently. The potential can be quite different as long as we embrace the basic principles of love, truth and humility, the potential can be very, very different. And there are many people who used to live on earth, who now live in the spirit world, in the celestial kingdom, who no longer experience fear anymore. They no longer experience sadness. They no longer they only have huge amounts of joy, peace and and activity that they engage in. Because they have embraced this process that I taught in the first century and that I returned to earth to taught, teach again and that we can actually do here on earth. We can actually do the same thing. We can become celestial spirit inhabitants while we're alive on earth. We can be that happy while we're here. We can be that content while we're here. We can be connected to God 100% of the time while we are alive here. And we will no longer feel the things we currently feel. In the first century, this is the state I got to by the time I was 31. And, and that's the state that everybody sees, oh, but Jesus was different. No, no, no different. No different to any other person. The only difference was I recognised this state was possible and I had faith in taking the steps that I needed to take to achieve it. And I did that. That's the only difference. Other people did not have that faith and so therefore they did not take the steps. And what I'm trying to encourage each of you to, continue to consider doing is to take those steps. To take the steps towards that one month with God because you will not at this point even understand the joy and peace and blessings that that can bring to your life. But God is good. God has made a beautiful system and if we trust in the goodness of God we will eventually accept the process and go through the process so that's what I'd like to encourage each of you to do and in fact that's probably a good time to finish our discussion yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so if I could not have any more questions because I just feel that in summary if I could just summarise God loves you. God has created a universe that is attempting to illustrate this love to you. The problem that we have 
is that we are not becoming like little children and absorbing this universe. We have used our powerful intellects down a direction that is very unwise by walking away from God and becoming self-absorbed, self-reliant. And in this process, we just bring pain and suffering to ourselves. Once we connect or reconnect with God, which is a bit firstly about reconnecting to your own emotional self, because that's essential. You'll reconnect to others as an automatic process. And once you reconnect to God, you now have this ability to be in perfect harmony with love, truth and humility all the time. Every single moment of your life. In that state, nothing can happen to make you sad. Nothing can happen to make you afraid. And that's the kind of life that was the potential that God offered us as a human race. We chose differently and we've got the different results that we could have had if we, if we chose this one that God, the path that God had left for us to follow, then we could have had completely different results. And so what I'd like to encourage you to do is it, it doesn't matter very much whether you, whether you believe what I'm saying to you about my own identity or any of those other things. All that matters really is that we all come to know ourself completely and we desire to get to know God. And in that process, God's love as it enters us will transform us anyway. It will make us the person God designed us to be. Does that make sense? And the person God designed you to be far exceeds your imagination of what you should be. Do you, do you understand? It far exceeds what you believe you could be. And this is what God offers us through this process. And the process is logical. It makes sense. There is nothing like mystical about it, but it is a process that is a true process we can follow that can be, in fact, scientifically proven and that we can embrace. So why wouldn't we choose to embrace it? You know, there's only one reason why we wouldn't choose to embrace it. And that's this big emotion. That's, that's what we see as our enemy. But fear, I don't see as our enemy. And the more the closer you become to God, you will not see as your enemy either. You'll see it as your friend. It tells you where you're out of harmony with God. So anything that tells you where you're out of harmony with God is your friend. Yes? So if you can allow yourselves to feel through your fears and become like little children, allow the emotions to rise up, Connect to God, long for a connection with God, but also connect to these qualities. Like, really focus on them. Like, don't, don't, don't see anything else as your primary way of developing. You see, mo most people want to go to metaphysical things, spiritual body things, all these other things. If you can focus primarily on, is it loving, is it truthful, am I humble? Is it loving, is it truthful, am I humble? So much truth will come to you in that process. And in the first century I said, all these other things that you're seeking will be added to you. You know how you're seeking safety? Well, safety will be added to you. You know how you're seeking joy? Well, joy will be added to you. You know how you're seeking security? Well, security will be added to you. You know how you're seeking a knowledge of the universe? Well, that will be added to you too. And you know how you're seeking a loving relationship? Well, God's already designed one for you. That will be added to you as well. All these things will be added to you. All we need to do is embrace the basic principles. That's all we need to do. And if that becomes our focus in our life, and we forget about all the other things even, if that is our focus, things will change very, very rapidly as a result. So that's what I'd like to encourage you to do. Well, myself and Mary are uh, not going to be uh, back here for a while, I would suggest.
Um, we are off, uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, the next day, to England. Um, and I don't think we've got a meeting in England, have we? Yeah, no, to we're then to Greece, um, where we've got a meeting with some people there. And then we go back to England, and we've got another group like yourselves there, and in Greece as well. And then... Um, where are we? Uh, we're going to Athens. Yep. Can I have the address, please? Um, certainly. Can you... S I don't have it on me. I have um, it's on the website, but I don't, um, I don't have it on me either. Yeah, we both don't have it on us at the moment. Could somebody help you maybe with the website, with, if you talk to Eva? It's on the website. If anyone yeah. has an iPhone, I'm sure they could download they it. They can download it online. <laughs> and, so, and then we're back... Then we're back in England where we've got another meeting and then we go to the USA for two meetings with some people there. And then we come back to England, another meeting, and then home. So that's our, our visits over the next few weeks. The reason why I mention that to you, would you like us to mention yourselves to them, those people we meet, yes. and just pass on your love for them, um, even though you don't know them? Yes? No worries, we'll do that. Um, our Australian friends uh, who we have wanted us to pass on their love to you and there's quite a few hundred people in Australia that uh, knew we were coming to visit you. So, um, they can't they... wait to see video and photos. Yeah, yeah. video and photos. <laughs> uh, what's happened. And so Joy's from Australia as well. Um, and there was Rita, but she's gone to, Greek, uh, to Germany, hasn't she? There were a few others from Australia, but um, we wanted to bring their love to you because they, they were very enthusiastic that we were visiting you. And have helped us out actually with some funds to do that as well. We would like to also thank you for your donations uh, to help us get here. For those of you who were involved with that. And for those of you on the team looking after us and, and running us around and picking us up from the airport and giving us some warm clothes to wear and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> we would love to thank all of you for your involvement in that as well. Thank so thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> We look forward to hearing of your progress towards God. Yeah? And we look forward to hearing of your experiences as well uh, that you have on that path. You know, the different things that happen on that path. It's a um, great journey. It's a great journey, yeah. yeah. And we've uh, enjoyed getting to know, know some of you more intimately than we did before. And we also feel that uh, there are a lot of things here that can be embraced that will really... Uh, bring a lot of joy to each of your lives as well. We haven't spoken very much about earth change events or, or um, uh, the learning centre that uh, Pear and, and Eva want to set up up at uh, Wilhelmina, but uh, I'm sure at some point you'll hear about all of those different things um, as, as these discussions ensue between each other. So we thank you very much for your hospitality. And uh, we hope that you enjoy getting to know more of God and more of truth in this process. If we, and we'd like to say thank you for your time and energy in doing that with us as well over the last week or two. Thank you. Thank you.